Corona crisis over hyped. I'm with Mike Church today, and we're doing something a little different. We're simulcasting. We're broadcasting through Mike Church's channel, and we're broadcasting through my channel, so you'll hear some music and some other things that's over on The King Dude, Mike Church. And today we're talking about the Corona crisis, and Mike Church is over at the Crusade channel. What's going on over there today, Mike? Well, we are having a whale of what we call a free phone Friday, Doc. How about you? Hey, it's just TJIF Friday. <laughs> well, uh, now, uh, usually, though, during the rest of the year when it's not Easter, we're not supposed to say Happy Friday. We chastise people and go, it's not Happy Friday. You're supposed to wear a black. <laughs> I like Fridays. You like Fridays? Yeah. I like Fridays. Well, I mean, uh, Mike, what do we call the day in which our Lord was crucified? Good Good Friday. Friday. So there you go. So we are, uh, we are, uh, we've already done three hours on the Crusade channel. Oh my so, uh, goodness sakes. Yeah. I'm only on my second <laughs> cup of coffee. <laughs> well, I'm on uh, cup number three. There and, you go. and we were ready and rare and, uh, 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 to go here on a, uh, on a Friday morning. By the way, just letting our audience know on the Crusade channel, Taylor and I are doing the first ever dual cast. I'm we're on doing it. We're doing it. I'm on the Dr. Taylor Marshall YouTube feed. He's on the official King Dude uh, feed. And we're also out on the radio to a couple thousand people right now. So it's a triple it cast. It is a triple cast. That's right. It isn't. <laughs> Who needs a dual cast when you can do a triple That's cast? That's right. So I just want to reset that and uh, welcome all of you in from uh, Dr. Uh, Marshall's uh, very large and vibrant and very active audience. And uh, I'm sure our listeners have been prepped and been waiting for this all day long. And are excited to, to to hear it too. So, what shall we talk about? Well, we're going to talk about Corona. And my, 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 uh, I mean, I've been corona. I, I've been hitting Corona based on why are the churches closed? Why can I go get a burger and go to the grocery store and stop by the coffee shop and get an espresso, and I can't go to church unless it's some covert, secret, underground thing. Why do the bishops have us locked out of the churches? That's that's the approach I've been going after. And then even more so, I know you've been talking about this, Mike, is is this crisis, and first of all, we just need to say, people are dying, people are sick. There's dear ones to me who have been sick. I have friends who have been sick. I have no one in my family who has died of it, but I have friends whose people in their family have died of corona-related diseases. And this is horrible. We pray for them. Uh, this is a real disease. We're not saying it's fake. However, we are starting to wonder, is our government and other governments using this to manipulate the population? And I, Mike, that's what you believe, right? Uh, totally. Uh, let's just reset a couple of things. Number one, is COVID-19 an actual viral strain? Well, you got to know a little bit about coronavirus. And I've been all over this for five, six weeks now. I live, eat, sleep, and breathe this. There are four naturally occurring coronaviruses. All of us have them in our bodies right now. There's nothing you can do about it. What has happened is in, in, the, uh, in the recent past, we've been able to actually study these things, is we have strains of different coronaviruses. This particular one is called COVID-19. What does COVID-19 do? Well, we're still young in the pathology and the study of this, right? So we only know what we can gather from those who have died and the few autopsies that have been actually conducted. So much of this is speculation. People need to understand this is not a settled field of science. Anyone that tells you that we know exactly what's happening to you, we know a little bit. Right. We know a little bit. We also know some strange things. One, the COVID-19 strangely mimics, for most in most cases, what happens in an influenza A or an influenza B outbreak? Very similar patterns. Now, there are some differentiations. And here's one of the things that occurs when you get a COVID-19. And that is that uh, it invades a healthy lung cell and is actually able to penetrate it and it kills it. It eats it basically from the inside. It then becomes basically dead weight and it sinks to the bottom of your lungs. Mm. This is what gives people like uh, your friend, Alexander Shugel, who had it. Right. Alexander said when he came out of the hospital, he was, when he was in, he goes, man, I feel like I just got a, you know, uh, a, a weight on my chest. Well, you did. Yeah. You had billions and billions of dead lung cells that gathered in the bottom of the chest. And this is what 
is responsible for a lot, some of, not all of, the mortality, uh, especially in older people, because they're unable to fight this with the, they don't, right. the, the lung capacity is not enough. So you got to clear couple, it out. You got to clear it out. You got to clear it out. So just a couple of things. Is it a real disease? Yes. I would never say that it's not. Does it kill people? Yes. Is it nasty? Yeah. Is it a bad death? Yes. Here's my disclaimer, though, Taylor. My father died of Alzheimer's. Have you ever seen anyone waste away of Alzheimer? Don't lecture me about horrible deaths. Death is terrible. An influenza A death is not a walk in the park. It's not fun. An influenza B or a pneumonia death for a loved one is not fun to watch. So don't sit there and lecture me. You've never seen a COVID-19. You're right. I haven't. But I have seen death, and none of them are fun. So you can stop the fake piety with this is the worst death in the history of death. I can think of one that happened about 2,000 years ago that is actually the worst death in the history of death. So, you know, a couple of things that, uh, the, 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 just to get the terms of the argument uh, uh, on the table to, to begin with. Is it real? Yes. Do people die of it? Yes. So then we come to the next question. Is it a pandemic? Now, if you want me to answer that question, I'm, I'm happy to. But if you want to ask a different one, I'm also happy to answer. Uh, let, let's. I, I'm interested in the political question, and I know you talked right. about it a lot, and I and I haven't covered that at all before on my shows and all that. We're in an election year. Uh, this thing is killing the economy. Uh, it puts people into a scare. When people are scared, they act differently. They vote differently. So was this something that just randomly happened and then people, you know, ill doers sunk their claws into and started manipulating other people? Or was this something designed? I mean, how do you think this whole thing finds its origin and then finds its outcome? Well, that's a uh, that's a very good question. And it's a very uh, some of it is speculative. And some of it we know. So let's start with what we know. <clears throat> there have been three attempts to undo the election of 2016. Yes. You had the sham impeachment of President Trump. You had the Russiagate hoax. And then you had the other investigation that led to the Russiagate hoax. So there have been three previous attempts to undo the uh, people's decision of the United States 2016. You have to just be some kind of a, or you have to be someone that can, uh, that's lost the capacity to deal with reality to say that the players that instigated those three attempts weren't still gaming and trying to figure out, okay, He's going to cruise to re-election. What can we do? So, th th so this is what we know. Right, so then we, we also got Joe know, Biden. Right, we got Joe Biden. We also have Nancy Pelosi, uh, right. Pelosi on record saying, uh, "Once impeached, always impeached." And uh, I do know that uh, he he will not become president again. Again, she repeats herself a lot. Yeah. So the alleged fake, the alleged Catholic, the fake Catholic, Nancy Pelosi, wine box Nancy, as I call her, we know that she's still in the game. And we know that there, the political consideration is all we can throw up is Biden. He can't remember where he is most days. The man is obviously suffering some form of dementia. So to the political calculation, if you're a member of the Democrat Party, especially if you're high up in the DNC, you know that you're going to lose in 2020, November the 3rd of this year. Right. You also probably have a sneaking suspicion that the Republicans are going to maintain control of the Senate. And because of the sham impeachment and because of the Kavanaugh hearing, you're also probably going to lose a House of Representatives too. Well, what is a good, uh, enterprising, useful idiot for Moloch going to do in that political situation? The nuclear option. And the nuclear option is this. What are we hearing a lot about lately? Mail-in voting. Mm. Mm, gee, you talk about something that's just ripe for corruption. Mail-in voting. Never been done. Should, other than for, uh, you know, if you're going to absentee vote, you can mail it in, right? Absentee ballot is the only way it's allowed. And that's only for specific cases. Usually right. the military. Or if you say... I'm going to be, you know, get a note from your doctor or whoever. I'm going to be out of the country actually on election day. I need to, to, to vote in advance. So absentee ballot is the only form of mail-in balloting we've ever had. It's a very small, less than 1% of all ballots ever counted. So why mail-in voting? Well, 
If you do mail-in voting in states like, okay, count the number of Democrat governor states that are up for grabs. Right. Pennsylvania, Governor Wolf. Michigan, Trump won, right? Governor Dim Whitmer. There are a couple of other ones out there that Wisconsin. No, these states can easily be put back in play if you can get dead people to vote by mail. Right. Democrat Party trick for decades. If you can get dead people to vote by mail, illegal aliens uh, who are not supposed to be or don't have a, or can't prove their identification anyway, this is a recipe for a uh, for a disaster. Um, what's interesting about the political calculation, if you're Donald John Trump and you see this happening and these governors go ahead and decide that they're going to act or the secretary of states are going to act unilaterally and just going to do it over a legislature actually doing uh, a passing, which the Constitution says has to happen, then you're going to have a, a Bush versus Gore again. This is going to lead to a Bush versus yeah. Gore. Now, what I think is going to happen, here's the political calculation. Winebox Nancy is going to declare, she's going to say, number one, the election was tainted because Trump's in bed with the Russians. We knew it all along, even though we couldn't prove it. So we're not going to accept all the valid votes from the other states. We're only going to accept the votes that came in by mail ballot because we can actually count them. And in the House of Representatives, they're going to say, but that's not enough for an electoral college. So we're going to have an 1800 again. This is going to be Adams versus Jefferson. It's going to go to the House. The Democrats are going to vote for their candidate. They're going to put Biden in office. And then it goes to the SCOTUS, Supreme Court of the United States. That's how I see this whole thing you going really down. You really think that'll happen? I think some form of that is in the works because it's the only shot they have. You have to understand that before all this, Donald John Trump was the biggest threat to the deep state and all the machinations of the satanic deep state, too. He was the biggest threat to the deep state and the satanic deep state that ever had any shot at doing anything about it. And he was quietly doing things about it. So um, demons don't look. Demons don't take coffee breaks. They don't sleep. And they're not in unions. Right. They don't have rules. So whatever is at their disposal, and to me, that's a tool that's at their disposal. Right, right. Okay, now how does the how does the media play in all this? And then also, it's not just an American thing. I mean, about forty percent of my viewers on my channel are not American. They're probably like, "What's going on?" You know, <laughs> it, how does this affect the global structure? And then also, how does the media play into this? Well, the media plays into it. Uh, okay, we have well, we have different media now, Doc. Mm -hmm. We've got new media, me and you. Yeah. Okay. Then you have what's called well, the, the MSM. Don't say MSM anymore. That they're not the mainstream. They're, they're they're so far out of the mainstream. Right. The mainstream wouldn't recognize them. They came and knocked on their door. So what are they? You can call them legacy corporate media. So let's call them legacy corporate media. Right. So what role does the legacy corporate media have? Well, watch their broadcast. Watch the advertisers. Who's advertising on legacy corporate media? Big Agra, Big Pharma, Big Hospital. Big in name your big, they advertise on corporate media. So right from the get go, you know you have the players in the deep state. Man, why should I be watching Fox News? F A U X Fox Fake News. Why should I be watching Fake News? And I see a, a television commercial from McDonnell Douglas. I don't care if uh, what airplane I get on, as long as it's not a seven thirty seven Max. Right. Why do I need to know the McDonnell Douglas? makes the parts and makes airplanes just for an example here. So, you know, you have big media that is totally in collusion with big government. I mean, this has been going on for, uh, uh, since the 1960s. So the media's role is to do what media does. And that is to report what the company line is. Much of the company line, I believe is written by the CIA. Notice that in the Carter page, uh, 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 uh outrage that, it was the CIA with the FBI working together, right? Oh, by the by, that event that we call 9-11, remember we were told this wouldn't have happened if the agencies were talking to each other. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? The CIA and the FBI are now talking to each other. Congratulations. Didn't work out so well if you're a MAGA guy, did it? So we know that the, the CIA and the FBI are willing to go to the to the FISA court, the FIS uh, uh, the FISC, the, uh, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, they're willing to go to it. They're willing to lie. 
And they're willing to go in there and use uh, 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 false narratives, false data, and fake data to do whatever they can to stop the electoral process. Now, this was before he was President Trump. Remember, they were so threatened by him in July and August and September of 2016. That's when the whole black book from Russia and the whole Carter page and, uh, you know, the whole thing that was it was cooked up by the FBI to get the warrants to tap and to spy on. You got it, folks, you got to remember this. They spied on a American citizen who was a candidate for the presidency. Donald John Trump was citizen Trump. Of uh, he was uh, as I call him, he was Don John of Manhattan. Right. They spied and they got a federal court, a secret court that none of us know who's on it. <laughs> they got a secret court to actually issue warrants to tap the phones and to tap the communications to Carter Page. So these people are capable of doing anything, of absolutely anything. So the media's job and the CIA is to do what? is to tell big media what the play is. Right. You know, you, you, you might notice there's a, uh, you, you'll notice a couple of talking points. If you don't believe me, a couple of talking points that you're all out there saying right now. Did you say stay home, stay safe in the last 48 hours? You listener out there, even if you live in Italy, if you live in Austria, where Alexander's from, did you say stay home, stay safe? Well, you think that just appeared out of thin air? Yeah. And whole media campaigns to do this. You know, um, here's a, let me give you another one. This is a new one. They just trotted out. In the days and weeks ahead, or in the weeks and months ahead, we're going to find out. Why do I have to wait a month to find out something that you probably know today? Mm. So the media's job is to take the talking points that it gets, and it is to dutifully repeat them to a pliable, gullible population that will swallow them and will actually b believe that there's some actual reporting going on. So that's the media's role. And if you don't, and, and again, if you don't believe that, how, what percentage of your neighbors and friends would you say in your online community have been saying, uh, if you push back against, against anything, they said, I just want to go out, like Taylor said, I want to go to mass, man. Right. I just want to go to mass. How many of us said this publicly and were like, you, you just want to kill people. Yeah, you want to kill grandmas. Yeah, you want to, you're Paul Ryan from the 2012 campaign, right? You want to push grandma off the cliff. <laughs> <laughs> so you see that, how many people buy this, have bought this kill grandma thing? Um, the CIA is very good at what they do. And big media is very good at taking this marching order. Look, you and I know some of these people, they're not that smart. They're not smart enough to cook up the inner workings of a repetitive campaign like this. So somebody cooked it up for him. So that's the media's role. Okay, now, you're a Catholic, I'm a Catholic. Why did the bishops go along with it so quickly? In fact, bishops were shutting down churches before even businesses and government buildings and schools were closed down. And here in Texas, our governor says worship is essential. You can have worship. And guess what the bishops have done? Well, the churches are still locked. Sorry. Now, so, I wrote a book about this. I got my what, theory on it, but what's your theory? So was your book a fiction or is your book, you're talking about infiltration? I'm talking about infiltration. Uh, okay. Because I saw an ad on Twitter last night. I didn't know that you were a novelist. Yeah, I have three novels. I did not know yeah. this. So any are there any political intrigue in your novels? Well, they're, they're about, uh, the. it's a historical fiction novel during the reign of Diocletian. So 299. Uh -huh. AD to 303. You need guys need to keep this guy. This man here is a, he's a, he's a king of all media, man. He's on video. He's, a, he's, he's an author. He's got all it right, all. Enough enough. Let's get back to it. Bishops. All right, okay. Why USCCB. are bishops locking right. it up? hundred percent. Right. Well, no, there's now, I saw there was one in New Mexico and now I saw this morning there's either three more or two more. I think there's two more. So three total. Uh, why are the bishops saying, no, everything's staying locked. And they locked it up before even schools. Very good. Uh, very good question. Again, and there's an, uh, there is a very logical and easily obtainable information. L-E-P-A-N-T-O-I-N dot org. Lepano Institute. Mm -hmm. Michael Hitchborn has investigated this, and I can tell you the reason. And he and, and you, everybody knows this is Michael Hitchborn, who's on he's been on this show. 
at least twice. Okay, good, good. Yeah. So he is the founder and head and the president and the only employee of the Lepanto Institute, <laughs> just so you'll know. Um, here's what Michael has discovered about Catholic Relief Services, uh, USAID, and other uh, uh, big Catholic uh, NGOs, as we call them, non-government organizations. Mm -hmm. Basically, they, uh, well, number one, they promote contraception and abortion. That's, that's, the, that's the first yeah. thing. And they need to stop calling themselves Catholic. That's the first thing. Yep. And we're not talking about a couple of thousand dollars here. We're talking hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, we know that the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops is not funded by the collection plate. They are principally and primarily funded by grants from the United States federal government. Okay? It's Listeners insane. out there. It's insane. It, Once so you realize we, this, that the, the budgets are coming from your tax money, not the plate tithe money. Which, you know, I, I maybe I wouldn't have as big a problem with it if it was done like it's done in Germany, where you know that that's actually the case. You know, in Germany, at least they tell you, hey, we're taking 10 percent of your taxes or whatever and giving it to the Catholic Church or the Lutheran Church or however it is that mm -hmm. they do it. No such full disclosure here in the United States. So the USCCB gets its money from the federal government. Now, it. Think about this. I don't know how many tens of thousands of dioceses or, or local parishes and dioceses across the United States. Many of them now really struggling because their bishops said you can't have mass. And the parishioners are going like, man, I can't get the sacraments. I'm almost out of a job. I can't send Father, you know, the you know, the usual tithe or whatever I send him. So, you know, local parishes are being clobbered by this. Maybe that's intentional. Hmm? Maybe. Well, Depend on one of my theories is so. Back in 2019, I said, look, 2020 is going to be financial scandals. You're going to see not only parishes and Catholic schools, but entire dioceses filing for bankrupt and and firing, laying off half of their diocesan staff. They'll keep the priests. They got to keep them. Everyone else is going to get canned. And what I think they're going to do, this is very convenient, is, you know, maybe it's this Christmas, maybe it's next spring, but all these bishops, they file for bankruptcy, everyone gets fired. And they're like, well, it, it wasn't our mishandling and paying out of sex abuse victim claims for the past 10 to 20 years. It was this darn corona. That's the reason why we're all bankrupt and, and all the churches are closed and the schools are closed and we're having to consolidate four parishes into one. Corona's going to be their scapegoat for why they failed as bishops. Well, and it's a mighty convenient scapegoat, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, let's go back to the question of where they get their funding from. If they actually had to old school it, if it was only coming from the collection plate, no government, this would not be happening. Right. Every parish in the United States would be open with social distancing rules. Yep. So this is how you know, if you doubt Mike and Taylor, this is how you know that the gov that the uh, the federal government of the United States is funding the USCCB. Now you may be going like, okay, wise guys, well, how do they do that? You ever heard of refugee repatriation programs? During the Obama administration, a couple hundred million dollars a year was given to the USCCB to do what? Repatriate or patriate principally, and this is where the outrage gets even worse. I know. I know what you're gonna say. Muslims, I know. Muslims, Muslim immigrants. Not, Muslim not immigrants, Lebanese, you know, Christian immigrants or Armenian, Christ, but Muslim, Mohammedan immigrants. And uh, why would Obama want to do that, though, Mike? Gee, I wonder why. Uh, so w the outrage is, is twofold. Number one, why are you on the government payroll, Bishop? Number two, mm -hmm. Muslims are our enemies. Did you not know that the country of Spain had an 813-year-long war with Saracens that had taken over part of Spain. It took them 813 years. <laughs> That's a lot of centuries. From 711 A.D. till 1492, they were fighting it out. <laughs> to get rid of, uh, mm -hmm. to, to, to get rid of the, uh, 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 of the Muslims out of Spain. Um, you know, uh, the great Hilary Belloc wrote a book called The Great Heresies. What the last chapter is? He saved the best for last. The last chapter is the Muslims. Yeah, and Hilary Belloc said, and at the time Hilary Belloc was writing, uh, what we call modern day Ataturk or Turkey 
was was smoldering in the uh, the the ashes of what used to be called the Ottoman Empire. Mm -hmm. What's the Ottoman Empire? Well, I'll just give you one quick uh, anecdote. The Ottoman Empire's navy was sunk to the bottom of the Mediterranean at the Battle of Lepanto. That's right. So the Ottoman Empire was the Muslim world caliphate, if you will, in the eastern part of Europe. Still there today. Different name, same Muslims. So why in the world would you be – let me just give you an example of a, of a Muslim who was immigrated into the United States. She's a member of the House of Representatives now. Her name is Elon Omar. Elon Omar is just a prime example of they have no desire to assimilate as Christians, certainly, certainly not as Catholics. They have no desire to assimilate as uh, uh, American citizens living under a little r Republican form of government. They're perfectly comfy living in what we call Sharia law. Yeah. Why, in, why in the world would any Catholic clergy, you don't even have to be a bishop. I mean, an altar boy. Why would an altar server want to immigrate someone that is antithetical yeah. to the Catholic church? And even if we just leave the church out of it, just go natural law for a moment, antithetical to Republican rule in the United States, it just boggles the mind. Very simple answer, folks. Money. Yeah. Money. All comes down to money. And I hate to say it, because I, I am Catholic. I don't want to admit that, but you know, it, you have to admit it because it's the truth. Yeah. Yeah. Sadly, and this goes back to a certain villain who's still roaming the earth, who has not apologized, ex Cardinal Theodore McCarrick, mm. the mm. number one Cardinal. Cardinal Archbishop of Washington, D.C., Metropolitan Archbishop, who ran around with the Clintons and ran around with the Bidens and the Pelosi's. I was in D.C., Mike. This was 2000. Hmm, see, now I can't remember. Six, seven, something like that. When they won, the Dems won back the House. Nancy Pelosi had. That a, was 2006. Okay. I can tell you. That was 2006. So 2006. See, I can still remember a little bit. She had a victory mass. In D.C. I remember this. And the new bishop who had replaced McCarrick was Donald Worrell. And it was revealed that in order to have this special mass with her and all of her friends, they had to have permission in the church. And it came from the archdiocese. Worrell gave the green light for Nancy Pelosi, who votes for the murdering of infants in their mother's womb, the opportunity to have her victory mass, holy mass, Catholic service in 2006. This goes back a long time. Ex-Cardinal McCarrick was, is a criminal. In my opinion, he deserves the death penalty for what he's done to young boys and vulnerable adults and, and also what he's done to our church. He appointed all of these slick uh, infiltrators to come into our church and to compromise what we believe, which is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and that our Lord was born of the Virgin and died on the cross and rose again. All that has been set aside, and it's all about helping uh, liberal government institutions to get money and power and to extend their influence over us. That's what happened. So now you've waded into something that we could really get into the weeds. But let me address the Pelosi mass. You know, mm -hmm. she did that again in 2018, right? You know that it happened again, right? I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Oh, now McCarrick didn't have anything to do with it. Of course. But it most certainly happened in Washington, D.C. It's on YouTube. You can watch it. Guess who spoke during the mass at the pulpit? Who? Elon Omar. Oh, my goodness. There were Muslims in attendance. Oh, I've seen that. I've seen a picture of this. I didn't know that that's what it was, though. Yes, uh, it it it's it, it, it's it's outrageous. You know, we could spend the rest of the of the, of the time that we have talk, talking about who I call uh, uh, wine box Nancy here, uh, but the outrage is here. Uh, it just boggle the mind. Now let's go back to two thousand and six. Who else was roaming the planet freely at two thousand six? At the time that, come and listen to the story about a man named Ted. Poor pet or ass barely kept his habit fed. Who else was roaming the streets of Mordor and the Potomac River 
in 2006 that's now supposedly committed suicide. Jeffrey Epstein. Mm. Who else was Roman? I see where you're going, Mike. So there's, an, there's, there's, there's a group. There are groups, plural, glute groups. So if you're watching this in Europe, if you're watching this in Italy or in France or in the United Kingdom, uh, there are pedo groups across the world. There's a network of pedo groups. There can be no doubt the child sacrifice. Well, abortion ain't enough for these people. Yeah. And I'll just, uh, and we can talk about a little bit about this and if, if you want. Uh, when you say the name Jeffrey Epstein, Jeffrey Epstein now has an heir. And it's not the woman. It's not the uh, the Maxwell woman. That She is not the heir. The heir is Marina Abramovic. Ooh. Marina Abramovic is the heir. But let me go back to Epstein here. The web that Epstein spun of very famous, very influential people that I believe it would have been revealed and we would have found out from those those flight logs if it ever went to trial. Who knows how many uh, Catholic bishops and maybe even cardinals would have shown up on Epstein, in Epstein's in Epstein's uh, in Epstein's web. But here's what we know: we know for a fact. This is fact. We know for a fact that on the Epstein Island there were satanic services that were going on. Yes. We know for a fact that children were brought from New Mexico and Mexico were flown to that island for this sick, twisted, I don't even want to describe the uh, uh, what, what occurs, yes. but we know for a fact that this happened. We also know for a fact that there were many Catholics that knew that this was going on. At the very least, they knew and did nothing about it. These are all facts. We also know for a fact, all the way up at the top, Somewhere in the Vatican, uh, or amongst those in the Vatican, there are those that knew and today know about this. Yep. So, what do you have here when you bring McCarrick up? You you have here what we would wh- what we would expect evil to do. You know what does our Lord tell us? There's in 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 the in the New Testament, our Lord gives the most harsh punishment punishment in all of his teachings to people who do what something to one of these little ones. Yes. He says, for, woe be to he who does, who corrupts, yeah. I'm paraphrasing, corrupts one of these little ones. In one instance, he says it would be better for him if he were not, if, if, that he would not have been born. And another instance, he says it would be better for him to have a millstone tied around his neck, thrown into the bottom of the deep sea. Um, that's so wait, how, Mike, are you saying that our Lord promoted capital punishment, death penalty? Is that what you're no! saying? Jesus Christ himself, second person of the Trinity? Yes. 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 Not only did, but and Dr. my position Marshall, is any priest who molests and does these things to little ones, he should receive the death penalty. No, I mean, he should be tried. But these guys, if anyone should receive the death penalty, it's these evil Judas priests. Well, post Catholicly sponsored and par- par- partially sponsored and funded Kinsey studies, supposedly the pederast can be reformed. They can't. They, yeah. I'm sorry, they can't. The only shot they have to get to heaven and redemption, if we are truly charitable and merciful, is the, is the death penalty. It's the only shot. It's their only way out because they can't be reformed. Once pederast, always pederast. Don't believe in it. Uh, they could be. They won't become recidivists. Yes, they will. But uh, let's go back to the, the drowning at the bottom of the sea. So our Lord tells us it would be better off for anyone that does anything to one of these little ones. It would only make sense then, he being the incarnate wisdom, he that exists and lives out of time, Uh, He doesn't need time. We need time. He doesn't need time. He knows what's going to happen. It would only uh, make sense that to warn us into the future uh, and for us to be able to go to the gospel and to see who might it be that the evil one ultimately, the ultimate prize is children. Hmm. We're warned. I mean, he gives us the punishment. He tells us. So we're warned at children. So it should be no surprise that the homosexual, uh, the, the 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 homosexual priest and the sexual abuse priest. What I get, I think it gets something like I don't know the stats. Maybe you know them. I've seen them, but I, I forget. 10, 15 percent are heterosexual abuse cases. Yeah, I think it's a eighty, about an eighty twenty split. So is that uh, so? Uh, so the victims of uh, uh, are eighty percent male and tend to be a bit older. You know, around. I don't know exactly the ages, but let's just say, you know, 12, 13, 14, and then 20% female. 
So, you know, we have, uh, from what we know from what has been d- discovered about what McCarrick did, you know, from all the thousands upon thousands of lawsuits that have been settled, you know, the Archdiocese of Boston is practically broke because of all the money it's had to pay out. The Archdiocese of New York is practically broke. There are others, and they may even be broke. This is why they want to close certain churches down, like Holy Innocence in New York, in New Teen mm. Teetland City, as I call it. Of all churches to close, I love that, that church. One? Holy Innocence. A shout out to everyone at Holy Innocence in Manhattan. Beautiful. Love beautiful. that place. I've been to Mass twice there. It's, uh, I've been to Mass once there. Stunning. BLM. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a stunning place to go to Mass. But uh, uh, of what we know, it always seems to involve children. Children. Now, let's just go just st- take a step back about the politics of all this for just a moment. Let's talk about the Corona Borg. Or the corona, what I call the corona hoax. Now, again, we're not talking about COVID-19 as the disease. I'm talking about the what's being done about it. So let's separate the two. Disease here, reaction here. The first thing that was done was to see if you could get away with this shelter-in-place, uh, stay-home, stay-safe mentality, okay? Yeah. Uh, if you can condition people to actually accept this nonsense, this tyranny, and actually do it, you've 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 conquered uh, 330 million people without basically firing a shot. Yeah. You you see how malleable they are. What's the second thing that they did? I'm going to take your business away now. Now note, mm. the Fortune 500, your big companies are pretty in, well insulated and shielded from this. They are not going to go out of business. So the Corona hoax was an assault. And if you think about this, folks, you'll get this. The Corona hoax was an assault on the middle class. But wait a minute. There's a, there's a caveat. It's an assault on the middle class business owner. Mm-hmm. It's the middle class business owner that has refused to break, bake the cake, has refused to march in the parade has refused to fly the rainbow flag, has refused to participate in Pride Month festivities. But look at his counterpart in in uh, in Fortune 500 big, in big business. They're all in. They all threw in. Yeah, they fly the flag. They march. Fly the, fly the flag. They participate. They have parades. They uh, they have programs for, uh, for 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 homosexuals to come out of the closet and are actually served. My, it, w- my point with all that is, is that it's the little guy here that needs to be squeezed out, so the big company can come in, mm-hmm. and then the big ce- so you have a central s- distribution source for food, central distribution source for computers and phones and what have you, and. Almost anything else that you need. Does that sound like a smart idea for 320 million people? It doesn't to me, but that's what's in play. So when you're wondering, like, well, how can these two sit there and talk about this conspiracy and that? Look around you. <laughs> Look around you. I don't have to talk about it. You can walk. If you're brave enough to go to the store, you can actually, and I say brave enough because you may be accosted if you don't have a mask on, uh, you can see this in real time. Which would bring me to a next point that you and I talked about yesterday. I want to just segue into something that's coming up. By the by, if you're watching on the Crusade Channel, it's my dear friend, Dr. Dr. Taylor Marshall. Um, uh, And we are doing a dual TriCast, Crusade Channel Radio, Taylor Marshall YouTube, uh, Crusade Channel YouTube. Let's talk for a moment about what is the date certain that the next round of government tyrannies from government, from govern, governor edicts is supposed to kick in. What day? May the first. Why do you say now, that? Now, you wrote the book on it, man. <laughs> I, I'm going to defer to you. You talking about because of communism? May Day. Yeah, May Day. It's May Day. His Holiness, of blessed memory, Pope Pius the Twelfth, gave us the antidote to May Day. Saint Joseph, the Worker Day. Yep. You think it's an it's an accident that these useful uh, uh, Moloch, these useful idiots, Moloch's minions, are all choosing May the first as the trigger day for must wear masks, must stay in place, must do this, must do that. I'm going like, how could you possibly know what's going to happen 13 day, 11 days from now, or or or, 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 or today it would be what uh, eight days from now? How could you possibly know what's going to happen next Friday? How could you possibly? You don't. The date was chosen 
as May Day. Now, how do we get May Day, Mr. Uh, author of, Inf of Infiltration? It goes all the way back to the Masons in the, in 19, uh, 18th century France. It goes right. all the... It, it, folks, and it's attack, and I mean, for us Catholics, it's an attack because May, traditionally for us, is the month of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and there's a lot of traditions and ceremonies and all that. So it's definitely a an open attack. Uh, and like you said, the church put in, okay, you guys want to talk about labor and all that? Well, on, on May 1, I'm going to make St. Joseph the worker, <laughs> the foster father of Christ, our Lord, will be this, celebrated. This is Our Lady of Walsingham. I keep her on my desk. Mm -hmm. What is also going to be next Friday, Doctor? First Friday. Oh, it's going to be first Friday. Oh, gee, what a coinky dink. Ah, I didn't see that one coming, did you? So you have first Friday, May Day, on the month of Our Lady. Mm -hmm. Who is going to crush the head of that serpent again? Yep. Do you believe in coincidences? Because I don't. So you think something good on our side is going to happen on May 1? I don't know. Please, like, <laughs> please tell me you think that, Mike. We need some help here. No, okay. I, I think something very evil is being planned. I think that the Marina Abramovics of the world mm -hmm. and the heirs of Jeffrey Epstein are planning the mother of all satanic ceremonies as a you-know-what to Our Lady. That's mm -hmm. what I think. On May 1. Uh, uh, St. Joseph will not be mocked. Our Lady yes. will not be mocked. And God, God will, will not be, be mocked. God will not be mocked. So is there a big uh, event in the offing? I keep waiting for Father Heilman, maybe. I don't know, Father Ripperger, mm -hmm. maybe Archbishop uh, Vigano, mm -hmm. for someone to figure this out. Maybe they watch this video and go, wow, mm -hmm. thank you. And a call for a day, a real First Friday. Because on a First Friday, it's all about the Sacred Heart of our Lord. Yeah. That's, that's our First Friday devotion. Mm -hmm. So call all Catholics across the world. And Bishop Strickland has kind of said this. He didn't give a date, though. Yeah. Um, to call for all Catholics across the world, they have fasting, even though it's Easter, abstinence, right? They have abstinence, prayer, rosaries, and we got to have the expeditions, expositions. We have to be able to go and do adoration of our blessed Lord on that first Friday. Yeah, that's so, what I was going to say is first, you know, in Catholic tradition, first Fridays is a time when you go to church. Well, guess what? Church is locked. I mean, they got to be opened. Yeah, but how do, how do we get these bishops to open the doors? Maybe we don't go to the bishops. Maybe we go to canon, uh, canon law made easy, canon right. law number number 27. <laughs> canon law number 27, right. no mass, no, no liturgical event is private. It's true. That's what she said. You right. want to interview her. I'm reading this going like, what, why don't all the priests know this? And maybe they do. They may be, I mean, I wouldn't want to be a, a, in this position if I was a priest. Then again, Maybe this is where saints are made, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is where maybe our heroes uh, go out yeah. to the battlefield and say, "Your Your Excellency, or Your uh, Your Excellency, I'm sorry, I disagree. You're wrong. I'm having mass yeah. now. If you want to tell me that you're going to do whatever to me, then you go ahead and do that. But you can't stop me from a public because it's yeah. a liturgical event. You can't stop me. Does he have it in the field? Does he do the exposition right. under a tent? Right. Does he go to someone's house? You know, folks, I don't know. Let's, let, let's all pray for our, our dear, beloved priests. Uh, I know many of them are out there going like, I just need a spark, man. I just need a spark. Uh, and maybe I, I think, Taylor, next Friday is the day. Something is coming. I don't know what it is. I wish I did because I would love to tell all of you. But uh, I think something is coming. And I think the trigger day is next Friday. By, by the way, do you know who Father Donald Calloway is? Oh, of course. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Father Calloway comes out with this great book this year. It's called 33 Day Consecration to St. Joseph. Now, some people did theirs. They started in January and they ended on the feast of, uh, in February and they ended on the feast of St. Joseph, right? March the 19th. March 19th. Uh, March 19th. Uh, I didn't. I started mine. So mine will end. And I've got a group of like 70 guys that are doing it and gals. And I'm sure many of you are. Our consecration day will be next Friday. Okay, May 1. So so we have lots. We have people across the globe that are following Father Calloway, are making this consecration. Most of us are already consecrated to our Lord Jesus Christ using the formula of De Montfort through Our Lady, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Folks, we're just making, we got the Trinity now. We got the Holy Family. 
So men, men, I'd say hundreds of thousands of us will now be consecrated on the same day. And those of you that already are, you're already there. Consecrated on the same day to the Holy Family on the day that the communists celebrate victory over Christianity. And on the day that uh, Pius XII declared, no, this is St. Joseph, the worker day. And with all of this that is going on, yeah, I see it as a big event, big yeah. event. I don't know what, again, big event though. You know, it, the, the sad thing, Mike, is in this moment of darkness, you know, we as Christians, we as Catholics, it would be wonderful if we could rally to our bishops, to our cardinals, to look to them and say, lead us. What, what do we pray? What do we do? What, what books of the Bible do we read? What spiritual literature do we read? To look at the Pope and say, we're being overrun by eco, you know, heresy and globalism and communism and attack on the family and pornography and all that. And, and look to Rome and, you know, see a man with a papal tiara giving us commands like a general. The most frustrating thing, I'm a, I'm a convert to Catholicism. The most frustrating thing is to live in this darkness and to look up to the leaders and see them locked away in their rectories. Silent. And the things that we get from Rome are, you know, stuff about, uh, what do you talk about? Minimum wage or something on Easter? Living wage. Living, Living wage. wage. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's what we got. Jesus Christ dies and rises again and brings hope for all of us that we can have eternal life. And we're talking about living wage. It is the most discouraging and frustrating thing. I mean, if I didn't have a supernatural faith in the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, I'd, I'd lose my mind. Well, the great American author H.L. Mencken once said, uh, once wrote after the election, I think of uh, Woodrow Wilson or the re-election re of Woodrow Wilson. Mencken wrote that because he was very disgusted by it because Wilson was a disgusting man. Uh, Menk Mencken in his own tug and cheek way said, well, you know, I've always believed in democracy and I've always believed that the American people ought to get the government that they vote for and they ought to get it hard. <laughs> hmm. Well, we can kind of bring that into Catholicism, and I think that what we're seeing now is that the people of the American version of the Catholic Church are pretty much getting the Catholicism that we've either practiced or have gone along with and accepted, and we're getting it hard right now. You didn't think you needed to go to confession before Mass for 20 years? You that have been going every week? Guess what? I'm just going to go ahead and take confession away from you. How do you like me now? You see where I'm going with this? Yeah, yeah, I know. I, I get it. I've read the Old Testament. <laughs> I know how that stuff works. People, you know, the people of Israel worship idols and they right. engage in sexual immorality. And God says, okay, taking away priests, taking away the temple, taking away all the spiritual benefits that I, the one true God, have given you because you have become an adulterous and stiff-necked people. That's that's the story of the Old Testament on repeat. Yeah, it is. Um, well, don't you think then that, that history repeats itself, right? So the Old Testament is filled with either prophecy or types, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it seems to me that this is a type of the church's suffering then. Yeah. And that maybe that that's what we're, we're in the event. You know, why don't we spend a few minutes, if it's okay, talking about the Leonine prophecy of mm -hmm. what, our, our, what Leo XIII saw the day uh, they, they, that uh, he went and wrote the St. Michael prayer. Our Lady of Fatima. And then Our Lady of Akita. And then how does that measure up to today? Because to me, it seems to me that those events, you know, because Leo doesn't say that the vision that he sees, that it starts that day. Right. Right? It's very complicated. We don't really know. I mean, I well, chased down all the sources and infiltration. And uh, it's very, some people say, oh, it's 100 years and there's different theories on it. But we don't, we don't really know because all that stuff is written over 10 years after, you know, Leo does all these things. But we do know that Leo had a vision. His personal secretary says that he, he had some kind of vision and that it entailed him seeing demons settling on the city of Rome. So we know that's a fact. And we know that then the Pope, Leo XIII, wrote an exorcism for bishops and priests. And he wrote the St. Michael prayer, which we all say, you know, hopefully I'll all say at the end of your rosary, he also had it attached to the end of the mass, a low masses, so that at every low mass, 
the the prayer of Saint Michael against Satan would be recited by the priest and all the faithful. But before that even happened, we had Our Lady of La Salette in the mid 1800s in which it described an infiltration, it described a persecution, it described all this suffering that was going to happen because, I love this part, Mike, Our Lady says, because people take God's name in vain, mm. you, people, you know, you see people OMG all the time, mm -mm. I tell my kids and people I know, I'd rather you drop F-bombs in my presence than say OMG or JC out loud. There's one of the Ten Commandments is against God's name in vain, not against. I, mean, I don't want them dropping f bombs either, Mike. But that's more serious. And then the second offense she says is people desecrating Sunday. So they're desecrating God's name. That's commandment number two in the Catholic Church. And then they're desecrating the Lord's Day. That's commandment number three. These are all happening. It's all happening. Now, let's go across the uh, France from La Salette. Let's go to Tours. At almost the exact same time, Sister Maria Saint-Pierre is receiving visits from our Lord, who's telling her, write this down. And he's given her the golden arrow prayer, right? He's given her the holy face devotion. Veronica's veil is revealed. The, the artists are called, oh my, we have, a, we have a, our Lord is on the veil. The artists draw it out. The holy face devotion is born and then is, is taken up at almost the exact same time. What does our Lord tell uh, Sister Marie St. Pierre? This is before the term socialist or communist is even invented. It hasn't even been created yet. He gives her a prayer for the French people to recite, to make reparations to uh, upon his holy face for his holy name because communism is coming to France. So you can verify this. So some people say, yeah, but La Salette's not this. Holy face is Leo the 13th made holy face universal. The devotion and the prayers are universal. So, you know, you have all this happening in, in France. And our, our sister St. Pierre had the exact same vision, Doc. Profaning the mass, profaning my faith, and then profaning my son, uh, my name. The, the, yeah. uh, the blasphemy against my name. And what is the golden arrow prayer? May the most holy, most sacred, most adorable, most incomprehensible and ineffable name of God be forever and always praised, blessed, adored, and glorified in heaven, on earth, and in the hells, and by all the creatures of God, and by the sacred heart of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the most blessed sacrament of the altar. All this is happening at right at the same time. So is it all related? I, I, I think that, you know, our, the Holy Family is, my, my take, we're, we're almost out of time. My take on this is this. This is the era, I believe, that we just came out of the millennia of Mary, and we're entering the time, the epoch, I don't know how long it is, of the Holy Family. St. Joseph is rising. Interesting. See, I, I agree that St. Joseph is important, but I think we haven't even entered into the era of Mary. Oh, okay. Well, maybe we, we disagree. Well, okay. Okay. Uh, but let's just say that, let's just say that the, the Holy Family, it's uh, absolutely uh, okay. We have a cross here. So yes. the Holy Family, the intersection, right? Okay. The Holy Family is definitely rising again. Yes. Coincidence? For sure. Uh, I, I, I don't think so. So, you know, what do we do? Well, uh, about our priests and our bishops, go to the Holy Family. You, you know, know, what I is did, it? I did a show uh, yeah, Wednesday, two days ago. Because I said, you know what? I'm so tired of fighting about all this stuff. I was talking to my wife, Joy. I'm so tired of the fight. I'm just going to do a show on St. Joseph. Because I look around at the Pope and, and bishops, and I'm just, I'm deflated. There's no, But then I'm like, well, okay, I'm going to look here on earth. Uh, that's kind of lame. Look up to heaven. Okay, I got Joseph. You know, he's kind of backup bishop for us. Well, go back to the Old Testament. Ite ad Yosef. Go to Joseph. What's on the base of the statue at, uh, in Montreal, at the Oratory of St. Joseph? Ite ad Yosef. Go to Joseph. Yes. You can't go wrong going to hop with you. Go to Joseph. Yeah, because in think... the Old Testament, remember the people, the, the patriarchs, the brothers, the original founders of Israel, you know, they were in bad shape. They had no food. There's a, you know, there was a famine and they went to Joseph. He was they in Egypt and even he's the, the one who helped them survive. Now later on the, they went into slavery 
that's part of the story, but he is the one who helped them survive. And so we got the Joseph of the New Testament, foster father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I think, you know, May 1's coming up. I like your idea. Let's let's go to Joseph. I have uh, twin daughters and a son that are yet to be confirmed, and they're adults, 22 and 23, respectively. Um, every phone call, I end thus. God bless and Mary keep you. Some of them, uh, one, one of them just goes, okay, dad, whatever. Mm -hmm. Another one goes, thank you, daddy. Uh, another one, I don't know what he says. <laughs> but I, we tell our children even though they're not in the church right now, we tell them, keep Our Lady close. Mm -hmm. Even if they don't actually do it in times of trouble, you know, think of Let It Be, the song. Uh, Mother Mary comes to me, uh, keep Our Lady close. Uh, and I believe that, you know, that, that's something the bishop and the loss of the mass is as sad and sorrowful as it is. They can never take it away from us. And if and a child of Mary can never be lost, and if you're close to Our Lady, then you're going to be close to our Lord. So, you know, in this Corona hoax, number one, understand this, folks. This is an assault on human dignity. This mm -hmm. whole mask wearing and all this stuff, we didn't get to talk about this. That's mm -hmm. an assault on human dignity. The Imago Day is what they're after. Mm -hmm. um, you got to know that you're being lied to and you're being manipulated here. Um, these governors, principally Dem Democrats, Democrats, are taking advantage of this, trying to see what they can get away with. May the 1st is coming. Their day that they have said are big trigger days for what they're going to do. They can't do anything. What, what, what do we learn at the end? Uh, the passion. What does our Lord tell Pilate? You don't have any authority to do anything, bub, unless my father above gave it to you. Mm -hmm. So our father above can also revoke that power. And I think maybe that's what we ought to be praying for as we yeah. approach May the 1st. Yeah. So this is kind of, uh, you know, I think we're all sort of confused and discouraged, you know, in this current Corona crisis. Every night, our family, we pray the rosary at the end. We we say we pray for our president, for the United States of America and for an end of the Corona crisis Pray that every night when we finish up the rosary and other prayers. But, you know, I just want this to be over. Now, there's been some good things in our family. You know, my kids are doing more chores and we're playing games and we're having, you know, fun and you know, it's it's been a good thing in general for our family, but I look at the economic wreckage that's coming. I look at the spiritual poverty we have because we don't have churches open and sacraments. And conf I mean, you can get confessions. You just got to be on the Underground Railroad, masses, etc., which I'm all about. But, you know, it, it's, it is a discouraging and confusing thing. And I think, OK, well, let's just all get together. May 1, let's get on our knees Let's fast, let's pray, let's implore God and say, we want you to intervene. We got nothing left. You know, it's like they said at the wedding of Cana, we don't have any more wine. We got water. And then Our Lady says, do whatever he says, fill the pots with water, your weak water. And then Jesus turns the water into wine. So let's just bring him our, our weak water and maybe he'll do something. Well, I, I, uh, I wholeheartedly agree. So, um, actually I got to go. I'm out of time, Yep. but are you Wrap saying that we, okay. Is Taylor Marshall calling for a day of prayer? I'm calling for a, yeah, I'm, I'm going to follow you on May 1st, St. Joseph I'm the in. worker. Let's all pray the rosary and fast and get on our knees. I'm just I'm a in. layman. I can't do any, I mean, I can't call anyone <laughs> to do anything. I'm a layman. We can say that we're going to do it. Would you like we're to join do us? It. Would you like to join us? Yes. Deal. Done deal. Deal. The church family deal and is deal. in. Okay, deal and deal. Well, Dr. Marshall, thank you for having me, for giving me the chance to talk on uh, on your show yep. and uh, for this uh, fellowship that we had here. Uh, folks, I hope you got a lot something out of it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hiding in plain sight on the internet at crusadechannel.com. You can find me. And uh, I'll be with you next uh, uh, next Friday. Let's, 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 let's plan a time so it all happens there together. There we go. That's a good idea. Well, why don't we say 3 o'clock? Perfect time. Hour of mercy. Let's, hour of mercy, 3 p.m. Is that Central or Eastern, wherever you're at? I'm in Central. I'm okay, going to do so it Central because it's through time, my time. Okay, so in the Central time zone then, well, let's do it by time zone. I think Yeah, that by that's time zone. Time. Wherever you are, do it at 3, yeah. At 3 p.m. Uh, okay, done deal. Sounds hey, you good. Got, you got 20 seconds to say a prayer? Got 20 seconds. Okay. Nomini Patris et Fidi et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. 
Almighty and gracious God, we ask that you would please help us. We have nothing left. And so we turn to you and we ask that through the Holy Ghost that you would bring us answers and clarity and bring this whole thing to an end. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Nomine Patris et Fidi et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Mike Church, Crusade Channel, go check them out. And of course, if you're not praying the rosary, you're not on the team, pray the rosary every single day. This is our weapon. This is our sword. This is the gospel on beads. Thanks so much, everybody, for watching. And uh, we'll see you on Monday. Mike Church, thanks so much. Godspeed. Godspeed to you, brother. Thank you. All right. And then everyone, make sure you subscribe, like, and share it on Twitter and Facebook. Bye.